she got her PhD at ETH Zurich, working with Christiana Bajani in 2010. And she moved to uh, Santa Cruz, where she's now working with uh, Pierre Amadou. And uh, today she's going to tell us about uh, the initial conditions and the uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks, Marcella. Thanks for coming. Um, as I said, yeah, my name is Annalisa, and I hope you don't get in my title is pretentious. It's just that in the past few years I've developed my research in astronomy on two parallel tracks. On one side I worked on the dark sector of the Santa Cruz logical model and ways to constrain the dark sector through observation of the large scale structure. And here I want yes, to mention in particular Cristiano Cucciani and Oliver Hans, uh, now in Zurich. Um, since one year or so, on the other side of the, of the cosmological pie, I have started to work with them by the SPA simulations of galaxy formation with Pedro Madao in his group in Santa Cruz and all the um, gathering team uh, being gathered in the code that I'm using. So within the standard cosmological model, our theory for structure formation has seen many successes because we know how to pass from the initial conditions of the universe to the large scale structure that we can observe in terms of galaxy surveys like SDSS and two mass. For the purposes of my talk, the, the CMB map is a good representation of my initial conditions on any time the matter do the matter domination. We don't only understand this passage, but we can even rep uh, reproduce it in supercomputers, like I'm showing here with a snapshot of the Millennium simulations, which is a matter only and body simulation of cosmological volume. Within this context, luminous objects like galaxies and clusters reside in subject gravitating dark matter halos. But while this passage is pretty easy, it's relatively simple, these other passages from large scales to small scales is much more complicated. And for example, we are not able to reproduce the huge variety in morphology of luminous objects at galactic scales that we observe, for example, in these uh, images from SSS. So I always find it pretty ironic that on one side, on large scales where gravity matters, we may even know how things work, but we don't know what things are, because we don't know what dark matter and dark energy are, and also, we, also inflation is still at the level of an science. On the other side, uh, we may know what electrons and photons are, we know what atoms are, but the physical mechanisms in place and their interplay are so complex that we cannot say we have a handle on galaxy formation. And so our simulations are still kind of inadequate and we don't really understand star formation and we don't understand very well feedback. So all this is to set the stage for my talk because I will first challenge one of the ansats of our standard cosmological model, so uh, namely the Gaussian ansatz. And this because I have in mind the model of inflation or any mechanism that generated the initial seeds. I will introduce the more than non-Gaussianity, show that non-Gaussianity naturally arises from the non-linear evolution of the gravitational field. I will show how non-Gaussianity has impact on the large scale structure and low rashes and how we can use it to constrain inflation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on small scales I will try uh, to understand better well, how the baryons affect the dark matter distribution at galactic scales. And I will introduce you to the ARIS simulation, which is an SPA simulation of, of a Milky Way. And I will systematically compare ARIS and uh, many flavors of it uh, to its dark matter only twin, which I call ARIS dark. And this has impact on the distribution of the dark matter and satellite abundance and properties. All right. so, as I said, I want to start from the initial conditions as a map of the CMB, and uh, the idea is that I want to understand what are the statistical properties of this field, uh, because in terms I'm interested on in inflation. So um, traditionally, we have modeled the initial seeds as a Gaussian random field, but this was mostly out of mathematical convenience. And this is easy to understand, because if you take a random variable with a Gaussian distribution, all you need to know is the mean, and if you rewrite it, it's the, it's the variance, so the second order central moment. If you deviate for a from a Gaussian PDF, on the other hand, you need all the higher moment to describe the distribution of your variable. And so beyond the variance, you need a third order moment, which is in with some normalization is called skewness or the cortosis. And this tells you, for example, uh, the level of asymmetry of your distribution or how um, tall and petite it is or swap and fat, um, and so on and so forth. 
Of course, in cosmology, we have a much richer structure. We don't have only main variable, random variables, but we have Gaussian fields. And by this, I mean functions defined in every, every point of the 3D space for which the value that they assume as, a, as the random characteristic, the random nature. And so variance, skewness, and kurtosis have to be generalized to take into account, OK, but if I look at a field and I, and I see the realization of this field in a point, what can I say about the realization of the same field in another point, or in a tripolar point, or in a quadrupolar point, and so on and so forth? And so we extend the variance to the two point correlation function, skewness and cryptologies are extended to the three, four point correlation functions, and so on and so forth. Or in Fourier space, as you like, with a power spectrum, or the spectra to spectrum. And what is important to take away from this preamble is that. Uh, with, uh, when you have a non Gaussian field, the power spectrum is not is inadequate to describe your uh, your field. You need more information. Or in other terms, you may have two non Gaussian fields with identical power spectrum and yet having completely different morphologies because a lot of information is actually encoded in subsequent and point correlation function. So here I've already given you away one thing. But uh, because I want to <coughs> show you a specific example. So let me add another piece of information. So when you have a Gaussian field, what is important you do a Fourier transformation and you get the Fourier component, you will have an amplitude and you will have an angle phase. If the field is Gaussian, the angle phases are uh, uncorrelated. So they are uniformly distributed within a given range 0 to pi. Well, if the field is non-Gaussian, these phases get correlated at the level for which you could also play around with two-point correlation function of the phases in real life. But what then? So, so this is something to, to keep in mind that a lot of information is encoded in the phases, and, and this is the information that makes a B-spectrum or a tree spectrum possibly non-vanishing. So this is, for example, a, a number simulation of the large-scale structure. I'm telling you, this is a very highly non-Gaussian field, and. The, um, and uh, Coase and Chung proposed the experiment of what happens if we take the Fourier components and we reshuffle <coughs> randomly the phases and the amplitudes of the components. And this is what happens. So in this experiment, no amplitude was touched. So if I do the power spectrum of this and, I, and this, they are exactly the same. But the morphology is totally different. And this is just to point out how important the higher order components, the momentum, <coughs> or uh, correlation functions are. And I've given away, again, another information, like that the nonlinear gravitational instability leads to non-Gaussianity. Uh, and so at redshift zero, we will always have signal in the B spectrum and the true spectra, because this is at least due to non-Gaussianity. If I have an additional primordial non-Gaussianity component in my primordial density field, this will superimpose to the gravity ones. And the problem is that usually the gravity ones wins over the primordial ones. And so you want to, to you need to go to higher and higher receives to gain a signal to noise. Where for me signal is primordial non and noise is the sum of the non and primordial non So now I'm gonna show you what I just said. This is a, a snapshot of, from one of my simulations and body. Uh, um, with Gaussian initial conditions. F and F is the parameter that describes it to modern Gaussianity, and I will introduce it better later. Uh, so this is initial conditions, and then I let it go from Rashid 50 to Rashid 10 to Rashid 2, and why insta gravitational instability <coughs> occurs if I do the, pro pro the PDF of the density contract, <coughs> of course I have to smooth it around some kind of different scale. I can see that while the time passes, the PDF becomes more and more non-Gaussian. And this is just what I told you. The gravity induces non-Gaussianity. OK. So now I compare my Gaussian simulation with a simulation identical, but for the amount of non-Gaussianity. This is only for illustrative purposes, because you may know that this value is really big. But what I'm, I'm showing here is, again, the PDF. And in blue is the PDF of the non-Gaussian realization. And in black is the corresponding one in the Gaussian universe. And so I let it go. And while it evolves, actually you can see that non gravitational, the, no, the primordial non Gaussianity from gravity catches up by the end. 
um, to be even more dominant, that the primordial component. Okay. Um, well, just to show you that if I switch back and forth and I switch on Gashanis and oh, sorry, uh, the differences in, in this projection are very, very small. Uh, and yet, the statistical properties of these large scale structures are the ones that allow us to get information on primordial and Gashanis. This is a, a, is a huge cluster. It's 3 10 to the 15 solar masses. A little smaller than Gaussian uh, simulation. And this, if I zoom in, and if I switch on and off, non Gaussianity, and I really like to see this, that although effects of primordial non Gaussianity on the properties of the halos are usually neglected, actually you can see differences. And every time that you look at two simulations, one with primordial Gaussianity and the other without, you can Im immediately see that the one with primordial Gaussianity positive looks like more and more linearly evolved. This is really speaking like the mental street. But anyway, so wh why all this interest in primordial Gaussianity? We local types, right? The one in the simulations, yes. Um, so, the idea is that different inflationary models produce different amount of primordial non And uh, I take the occasion to introduce the non-linearity parameter alpha now. So alpha now is zero means that you live in a, in a universe with Gaussian initial conditions. And standard inflation predicts something that is compatible with alpha now zero, or so small that you will never be able to measure it anyway, but we can come back to that. Other inflationary models produce values which can deviate from zero sensibly, and we want to understand. What, um, the trouble of non gaussianity is that it's so model dependent, and so also this parameter is model dependent, and it depends on the type of non gaussianity that in the end depends on the spectrum of the <coughs> correlation function of the, of the um, curvature at the energy of time. So you might have heard about local type, bilateral type, and so on and so forth. In this talk, I will always talk about local type of primordial non gaussianity where I do my transformation from the potential field adding a, a quadratic component weighted with uh, this FNL parameter. Okay? Um, but of course you might have, there are also additional corrections that you can do. I mean you have a, an infinite freedom here to change a Gaussian field to a non Gaussian. Alright. So I want to measure FNL and, uh, and uh, the idea is that one has to first figure out what are the effects of primordial non Gaussianity on a series of tracers. So you can look for non Gaussianity on the smooth density field or any of tracer of the smooth density field. At the point, you can go and look for the PDF, but like that is very tricky. You can go and look for the endpoint statistic with n bigger than 2. Remember, we have to put bigger than 2 beyond the power spectrum to get something. <coughs> You can study the topology of the field. You can also study actually the nonlinear evolution of the power spectrum, the one power spectrum. So just to say, um, the CMB has been the traditional probe so far for primordial non Gaussianity, and Planck is uh, expected to deliver very good constraints within a few months. Uh, at the moment, at two sigma, we have that uh, our universe is still compatible with a Gaussian initial with Gaussian initial conditions between values of this FNL between minus 10 to 74. And please keep in mind this kind of order of magnitude. Uh, in the past, I also checked the effects of remote and Gaussianity on another tracer of the, of, the, of the field, which is the 21 centimeter fluctuation. And, the, and the, we did this um, abstract experiment of measuring the three-point correlation function of the fluctuation of the 21 centimeter from crazy redshift, from the dark ages because I didn't want to deal with the astrophysical complications. And, uh, and, um, um, and we came out with extremely good results because you can do three-point correlation function in a series of these slices in redshift, and you just have to make sure that you're not counting information twice. Um, but what I want to focus now is actually the effect, uh, the effect of remote and on the large scale structure. So on the collapse of just a ratio of zero or one or two today. And this is because in 2008-2009, when I started to do my simulations, uh, it actually came out that uh, the effects of remote and are super cool on the bias of the matter here, and I will show you how. how. And uh, if, if, if you have to remember a reference, I would remember the Lalita 2008. 
uh, plus a series of numerical works. Okay, so, so we did a series of embodying large volume simulations with Gaussian and non-Gaussian initial conditions. We took standard initial condition generated by graphic and we re-modified re it to produce local primordial number sanity. And we used 10 to 10 to <coughs> two particles in box of 1.2 gigaparsec or even smaller for resolution tests and convergences. And I, modified, I had 12 universes with uh, spanning a, a series of values of this FNR. Uh, and I, I then went to quantify things in, this, in these boxes. This is uh, a first plot about the dark matter halo mass function, ever shift uh, zero. This is the differential mass function as a function of sigma to the minus one. Doesn't matter, these are big masses, these are small masses, for different values of that and If I take the ratio of halo mass function compared to f and equal zero, I can immediately see that for a positive FNL, and positive I mean that I modify the PDF pushing enhancing the, the positive density contrast. I end up having a more it is the, the high mass end of the halo mass function is enhanced. I have more objects at higher masses with positive FNL. And this is for example with the FNL 250, and these are different brushes. A ratio of zero, a ratio of zero point five, a ratio of one. Where you can see that the effect of the modern Gaussian is higher at higher ratio. And again, this is associated to what I was telling you before. So, at higher masses, more uh, more more halos, and at higher ratio, <coughs> higher relative effect of the modern Gaussian. But um, the best result. Uh, of those times in terms of what is the effect of primordial Gaussianity uh, on the large scale structure is the following. If, if you do the two point correlation functions, not of the density field, but the collapse objects or cluster, or uh, dark matter halos, then you end up with a halo halo or power spectrum, for example. And, uh, and uh, if, you, if you divide the halo halo power spectrum, for the power spectrum of the underlying dark matter field, you get the so-called bias, so the bias of collapsed objects. The, the punch line here is that in Gaussian scenarios, the bias is constant at large scales. Okay? While with primordial of Gaussianity, you get a K dependence, which is depicted here, the a K dependence, which goes by K to the minus two, with FNL local, at large spatial separation. And this was really, it's, it's really qualitative, it's not any more quantitative, which made everybody happy. And the effect of ethanol is a, a, so at fixed scale, this deviation is higher for higher values of ethanol. It's higher for higher redshift, and it's higher than higher masses. So it all goes with the, the variance of the, of the, of the halo mass, of, of the halos. Okay, so we saw the effects on the halo, dark matter halo mass function, the effect on the dark matter halo bias. And so people wanted to start to check how good can we, how, how well can we do in constraining national utilizing this effect. So I mentioned here uh, CMB results, 21 centimeter results, and then focusing on our large scale structure results. Um, other people and, and uh, my group calculated the uh, constraints from the dark energy survey, for example, a galaxy survey, or uh, the future Euclid, which is a European mission, all getting FNL constraints of the level of what Planck will be able to achieve. And this is based on two point, on two point statistics, while Planck is based on three point statistics, naturally, because this is based on the spectra, and these are, are all based on, on, on on power spectra of the halos. I did the same game working on Irusita. So Irusita, I don't know if anybody <coughs> is, is uh, familiar with it. It's a, it's a German-Russian telescope. It's going to be launched, that's wrong, 2014. And, um, and it will go to a two, a two orbit. And, it will, um, and we calculated that above a, a detection limit of 50 photons, counts photons per cluster, we, uh, and uh, the, with the full sky survey, we will detect something like 10 to the 5 X ray clusters of galaxies above 5 10 to the 13 solar masses. Okay, in a kilogram, it's the soft uh, X ray band. And uh, what I wanted to do is, uh, is 
uh, strong of the numerical uh, results and the analytical models that other people work on, I wanted to check how well in Rosita we do in constraining simultaneously the standard cosmological vanilla model with primordial Gaussianity and scaling relation parameter, which are the ones which allow me to map halo masses, dark matter halo masses, to photo counts, because I wanted to really work in the direct observable uh, that it would be effectively used by the Rosita people. So the raw photo count that every cluster emits and so the depth of the depth. And there was doing using Fisher matrices methods and recently we have compared with MCMC. Well, then, story short, um, I had to do this mapping between halo masses and photon counts where, um, of course, all here enter scaling relation parameter between luminosity in X-ray, temperature in X-ray, and so on and so forth. And uh, I, I calculated cluster bandwidths and cluster in a sort of a mock catalog, and then tried to get information. So the idea is that if I for now has a factor of that material mass function, this translates in a different amount of uh, abundance of clusters above a given mass. And if uh, it affects under the amount of halo bias, these will modify the spatial clustering of clusters. I used this and I came out with some results. I mean, there's no, I told you already everything. And these are, for example, some of my results. Of course, you have so much choices that uh, in the survey, uh, for example, you can, uh, according to what it will be effectively done, um, I can assume, so for example, I, I should even be my clusters in, uh, in mass bins, which translates in photo count bin. Or I, and I can also bin them in redshift if I have redshift information. And, uh, and, the, and the smaller the error bars, the, be the, better, the better I can do it. But just for example, in terms of the modern non gaussianity when I keep a lambda code parameter model plus non gaussianity plus my nuisance parameters, the scaling relation parameters, I really can get error bars on FNL local similar to what Planck can do. <coughs> and once again, I want to show you here, these are the literature results of constraints on sigma 8 and omega m from cluster surveys. Uh, the blue areas are erosita with a different assumption, and this is Planck. And it's always very nice to see how orthogonal they are, and if you combine them, you win up. Anyway, um, but it's happy to show you that erosita we still have to shrink further plan constraints, if you like, to see it the other way around, because it will help breaking up the generators. And I've extended this, including dark energy uh, models, uh, and uh, Erosita is halfway between uh, uh, stage three and stage four kind of experiments. So it's between dark energy survey and Euclid in terms of how well it will constrain the equation of state of the dark energy. All right. So, so far I always use in, in, in effects of primordial Gaussianity on the large scale structure, but uh, theoretically I was also interested in checking what are the effects on the properties of dark matter halos. This becomes harder and harder because if you do it numerically, you have to achieve fantastic resolutions to be sure that you are modeling the profiles of dark matter halo correctly. And I'm, I'm, I'm extending these works of uh, Abu Lanizet after 2003. And for example, primordial Gaussianity makes uh, profiles of clusters caspier. But uh, I mean, not, don't make me quantify at the moment. So the idea is that I wanted to go to Santa Cruz with here because it does zoom-in simulations uh, of galaxies. And I wanted to do zoom-in simulations of galaxies or clusters with primordial Gaussianity. That matter only and forget about it, Santa Cruz nobody cares about cosmology. And so, um, and also the uncertainties on the properties of the matter halos, which are due to the fact that the, the presence of baryons are so much bigger that you may want fix to fix the baryonic counterpart before even changing your standard cosmological model. And so that's what I started to do. And here I, I, I had my transition to smaller scales. So, I was mentioning that, okay, lambda photo matter works very well on large scales, and people tend to, uh, to think that lambda photo matter had some troubles on, uh, on small scales. Uh, this was particularly true around 2007-2008, when uh, individual galaxies at Milky Way masses 
were uh, simulated from the Aquarius group or the Via Lactea 2 group. Um, and these are again Milky Way halo sizes of explicit resolution. By this I mean more than 10 to the 8 parcels within the mirror radius and with a softening of which below 100 parsecs which is still something that we cannot reach if we put balance. These are M-body only. And comparison of, of analysis of M-body simulations of this type with our Milky Way observation points out a series of problems. So the problems are the famous core versus cusp, the missing satellite problem, and the new flavor of it, which is the too big to fail problem. So I don't want to actually overstate the importance and impact of these problems, but they are really always very good. Uh, um, uh, very good uh, expedient to, to, to go through a talk, so I will go through because historically that's what happened. So, Corpus is cut. The idea is that M-body simulations predict very dense halo centers with slopes of the order of minus one. So, our, t our, our formula, like Tavara Franklin my formula, or Enasto, of a density profile, density versus radius, have inner profiles that go like us, right? That, why Observation of these end words, so of galaxies of 10 to the 10 solar masses around, um, do not support cusps, but they, usually, they actually uh, show cores. And this, I should point to OETA 2008 to 2011. Many proposed solutions started to, to develop from uh, modifying the nature of the matter, from cold to warm, to self-interacting, um, alternative theories for gravity, but of course, you can imagine that as long as you don't add baryons, you won't know the answer because there might be halos are populated by baryons. And these are I'm, I'm going towards this direction in a moment. Then, in the, in the late 90s, there was the so-called missing satellite program. So the number of sabellos that were observed in these acquired simulations, the Alaska simulations, were order of magnitude more than the ones observed in the middle <coughs> In that, at that time, the <coughs> satellite of the Milky Way were the classical dwarfs, which are about 10, plus the Magellanic clouds. And there, there, was, there was really a mismatch of orders of magnitude. But in some sense, a comparison like this had to be done more carefully, because, for example, no selection bias were uh, taken into account, or even not observational cuts when comparing simulations to the observation. And so I, I have to say that recently, the magnitude of the problem in much less dramatic than, than before. Uh, but yet he pointed out to something. In fact, even though now we won't have an order of magnitude difference in the number of satellites, we cannot say that we know exactly how stars behave uh, at different mass scales. So proposed solution, for example, of the Chinese that that's where we were in from, a truncation in the halo mass function at low masses, 10 to 6, 10 to 10 solar masses, in the world of the model, or uh, suppression of star formation in low mass halos in some negative manner, or suppression of star formation in, other, in, in massive halos with other negative manners. And although the problem is maybe not there anymore, <laughs> still we don't know how to do that, so it's interesting to go on. A new flavor of the missing satellite problem came out last year by the Irvine group people. And this is known as a too big to fail problem. So, the Irvine people took the Aquarius simulations, which are simulations of the Milky Way, and, and selected the top 10 satellites of this Milky Way. Okay? And they selected it in many, many ways, uh, considering their mass, considering their peak of the rotation curves, today, I think, for and so and so forth. But what they were noticing is that if you plot the rotation curve, so V circ versus radius, of these sub halos of the Milky Way, in an M-body simulation, you get always curves of this type. Vmax is the peak of the rotation curve somewhere, while I'm looking at this kind of radius, two kiloparsecs or so. And this will compare with data points from the classical dwarfs, like um, excluding the Magellanic clouds, like uh, Carina, Draco, and company, inferred from observation. And then, uh, this group were, were all stressed because in all the Aquarius simulations, which were six Milky Ways, um, the top ten satellites were always more concentrated, so their profiles were always, always higher as a bulk of the populations than the ones which are observed. 
The contradiction lies in this fact that we think that the most massive subregulars have to host the, luminous, the most massive in stars, satellites. And so these are the ones we observe. So these are the most massive satellites we observe. And these surveillance in the Aquarius simulations are supposed to host these stars. But there is some kind of mismatch uh, in, the, in the properties, uh, in the inner properties of the object. So there are actually a series of ways around it. And um, I've list them, so, which were not considered by them. So first of all, the, if the mass of the Milky Way is smaller, uh, the, the cumulative surveillance mass function goes down. So if you do really a cumulative, so I call instead of masses, I work in V masses, and, uh, and this is V max. So if you take a, a dramatic halo, this is the typical cumulative surveillance mass function. And, and the slope is self-similar, so it doesn't matter if your whole cell is 10 to 14 or 10 to 12 solar masses, but the normalization goes up and down. So, so if you write it like this, okay? So if, you were, if your host is smaller, this goes down. But if this goes down and the slope is, stays the same, of course, you are suppressing the high mass halo, the high mass, mass end of your sub population. Then, if you assume that your sub population are Navarro, Frank, and White objects, you know exactly how your profile are. And so if your sub are smaller, they will have a rotation curve that is lower, and so there's no contradiction. Another way is that the scatter in the sub mass function is different. Uh, it's bigger, it's much bigger than what we thought. Because, as I said, we know that if you properly renormalize these V maps of the Sabellos by the size of your host, you get a given function. But it's not really clear how big is the one sigma, plus one sigma dispersion, even in the matter only scenarios. And so, of course, it may always be that the Milky Way is slightly peculiar, or the Aquarius simulations were slightly peculiar compared to the number of Sabellos above a given V max that you should have. Other possibilities were different cosmology that we are comparing our numerical simulation with a given cosmology with the other is a different cosmology. Or, uh, and again, my game is, well, let's start to add variants in the subelot and then let's see what happens. Okay. So these were the, say, problems by comparing simulations with observations. Um, there were also other problems in the past in reproducing galaxies even before comparing the number of surveillance and their properties. Because, for example, it was, it was always very hard to produce a disk galaxy. In the past, before these results, before these great progresses in the very last times, it was, it was, it was really very hard to produce disks which were thin, or disk to bulk ratios that were reproducing galaxies that we could see. Another thing is that, for example, galaxies had troubles to fall on the stellar halo mass relation that comes out from an abundance halo matching discussion. So lately, many progresses have been made, both using particle base and, uh, and the grid base uh, code. Uh, but I have to say, it's a tricky business. It's sometimes just a matter of choosing the parameters in your physical prescription program. But anyway, within these caveats and the fact that there are incredible, I mean, very hard differences of galaxies simulated supposedly with the same exact property, I mean the same exact uh, prescription and then they come out with completely different morphologies. Um, within this project, I have studied the simulation that Javier Arquides run, uh, which is a, the error simulation. The error simulation is, is, a, is a simulation of a Milky Way galaxy. We use the code Gauslin, which is an FPH code. Uh, and it's a zoom-in simulation, so we can resolve very, very, and we have very good resolution in the high resolution uh, region of something like 10, 1, 10 to the 5 solar masses for the dark matter, uh, and, and, um, and 10 to the 4 solar masses for the gas. And really here I'm saying that we are resolving areas with 18 million particles within the bigger radius, including the matter, gas, and stars by the time it's ever seen. I have to stress that Eris is considered the highest resolution 
simulation available nowadays, including variants, and still we are an order of magnitude less resolved than Aquarius and Via Lactea. And this is a trouble, and it makes me really get me with my headaches. Um, but anyway, the halo of, uh, of the Milky Way that was chosen in the material box has a five major history, is a likely Slightly light Milky Way, this is 8 10 to the 11 solar masses. This is spiral galaxies with a very good bulk to disk um, ratio in the, in the other end and so on and so forth. And it was produced with specific choices of uh, radiative cooling, of star formation, uh, star formation feedbacks, and so on and so forth. Here we have supernova feedback, not AGM, given the type of mass. So, so our term simulation. Uh, as it reproduced on the large case, on the host case, so well, the observation of the Milky Way, and I compared it to its dark matter only twin. Because, strangely enough, people that work in this field, they never <coughs> found the highest resolution possible dark matter on the <coughs> counterpart of, the, of, the, of their halo. And so I rerun Eris Dark, which is, has the same exact initial conditions as Eris, but in this case, the, the dark matter particle mass in Aries dark is the sum of the dark matter and the, and the gas mass in the Aries simulation. And here I show you the, the fields at 20 megaparticles sex scale in Aries dark and Aries. And it's not just the beamer, but it's really you couldn't see differences, and this is good. And then, but when you start to zoom in at the level of the halo, like 600 kiloparsec, this is the dark matter only field in both cases, but here it was run with the variants so with the production of stars and so on and so forth. You can start to see little differences, at least in the geography, in the projection that I'm showing you here, which is an identical projection. Okay, so my idea was to compare these two and to understand the effects of variants on the dark matter profiles of the host and on the properties and abundances of the sabellos, of the satellites, in, in this Milky Way. And, and for example, you can already see that if I keep fixed the definition of spherical over density halo, even just the bigger mass of the two Milky Ways is different. The dark one is slightly more massive. It's 9 10 to the 11 compared to the, to the bionic run. And I give you some folkloristic information because it's over. So, it's tricky to compare the simulations of this type because you will have differences which are unavoidable. Like, for example, in the, in the way we set up the initial conditions, we are, yes, sampling the gravitational field with the same amount of mass, but with a different number of particles. In one case, I have the matter particles, in the other case, the matter and glass. And so, for example, the tides, the tidal fields will be different. And for example, if I look at the center of Aries Dark Milky Way within my box, and the center of Eris in my box, they are a part of 80 kiloparsec. So they wandered in the box slightly different because they even emerged from mergers slightly different. For example, because in one case you have gas and the other, and in the other case you don't have it. So. <clears throat> this is the mass growth uh, across cosmic time, which is even here, of Eris dark in black and Eris. So this is to set my conventions. So every curve here that is red is about Aries, the baryonic run. And the black is Aries dark, the embody on the counterpart thing. And of course, in the case of the baryons, I can talk about the total mass, the matter mass, I can have gas mass and stellar mass. And in the end, for example, we have that Aries is a sub uh, has a baryonic <coughs> fraction which is slightly lower than the universal, say 18%, it's something like 12-14 percent according to the time, and we produced and we produced a galaxy with stellar mass of 4 10 to the 10 solar masses, which is within what we think the Milky Way has. Here I show you the rotation curves of the two hosts of the Milky Way, and again I have one curve for Earth's dark, and this is a typical rotation curve of the Anapara Frank and Wild profile compared to the rotation curves of the total matter in Aries. As you can see, this total component is so big because it's pushed up by the presence of a stellar component. So you can imagine the stars, they do form and, and they are at the very center of, of, the, 
of the galaxies. And here is a really where you can see the dot and you can see the disk within, say, 10 kiloparsec. But what Marsh would like to compare is the dramatic curve of Earth with the dramatic curve of Earth's dark. And you can see that they are already very different. I'm not saying in 1980, I mean, I'm confident. So even just to start, maybe to pass the idea that I know we don't have many other variables to describe halos, but when you have, when you compare baryonic halos with dark halos, Vmax really doesn't have anything to do. I mean, because in one case it's dominated by the stars. Okay. Instead of rotation curves, I really show you the logarithmic plot of the density versus uh, radius. And here we, we want to compare the dark matter of Eris dark and the dark matter of Eris. And so what do we see? So we see what people as always as often see. So that the presence of light <coughs> makes the profile contracted, and so this is the so-called halo contraction. But on top of the contraction, we see a hint of a core or, or, or a flattening. Um, and, so, and I'm working on understanding how the two things happen simultaneously. And if one can use existing models for the formation of the core. In some sense, I'm just adding sort of a data point to the zoology of contraction and flattening um, in simulations with baryons. And I'm checking now whether, for example, this is uh, the formation of this flattening is, is, is an agree in agreement and an extension to higher halo masses of what Maschenko et al. and Ponsen et al. has just he said, in particular, Ponce thinks that a flattening of this type is due to rep repetition of, of, um, of even small starburst that modifies the orbits of the dark matter particles. Uh, just one question. Yep. So when you take the profile of the dark matter in the simulation with gas, the center you choose by the highest density point of the gas or the dark matter? This is kind of fundamental. So um, when I say that I keep the definition of halo fixed, I, I also say the choice of the center, because my center here, by the <coughs> way, is actually <coughs> is a center of mass, actually, of the total, of the, all the components. So it's not just the dark matter. And, uh, and uh, I have checked that if I actually use the potential, the minimum of the potential, I still find sort of a flattening. So and if you just look at the dark matter, yeah, no, these are, there are differences because the dark matter has an offset, uh, or at least we, we think there is an offset. Um, we think that there is a physical offset. Of course, it, it's there. I mean, phenomenological is there. We don't know why it's there, uh, exactly. But yeah, it's, it's really tricky because the way in which you can define a center, I mean, you can do anything. But it's, of course, the, the size of the core changes a little, but it's still there. All right. And uh, <coughs> okay, uh, the problem is that, as I told you, it's it's a, it's a, it's very sad because we are at the boundaries of our resolution limits, and uh, I, I can discuss about it. Uh, ask me later because I'm running out of time. Uh, I would just want to say that, for example, if I run a conversion test for the Eris stack, the embody only simulation, I end up that I can believe this profile only down to something like. 900 parsec, okay, and then it deviates from, uh, it's very conservative estimate, but then it starts to deviate from an Avaro Franklin wide or an Astro profile. This is because, so when, you, when you're lacking resolution, you are producing a core artificially because the relaxation times in, the, in your simulations are, are bad. And so, <coughs> and so this, just to say that. If you see that there is a total core also in the embodied simulation, this has been always seen. It's just a matter down to which radius you can believe the profile. And so if you do the same, I may end up with a convergence radius that conservatively is somewhere between 500 and 700 parsec, which is a pity because I would like to go much in inland, in inwards, because the, uh, the core is just of a size of, a size of one kiloparsec or so. Well, anyway, I've studied how this core uh, evolves in times and so on and so forth. But it's not my main interest, because maybe you also find it more interesting actually to, wonder, to see what are the effects of running the same object with baryons in terms of the satellite population. Okay, 
So the presence of ions dramatically altered the structure of the host, right? And, um, and this must have an impact on the stability of population, and especially on the ones that survive erection zero. So because we have seen that the host change, the profile of the potential well is different. The shapes of the halo are actually different than the halo. And you can have, in one case, the presence of a stellar disk <coughs> in the barrier runs, as we do, or even a dark disk, or something that is really reminiscent of a dark disk. But these properties would, by their own, affect the resilience of a sabello to survive while orbiting and spiraling, or at least it would have an effect on the time that it takes to get destroyed. And so, and so also we tell you how much mass loss rating will, there will be, and so how many sabellos there will survive or she's here. The point is that variance has also effect on individual sabellos, on the substructure of those sabellos. The mass is different. The inner slopes of the profiles are also different as they are different for the, for the host. Orbits are, are changed, and pericenters are moved apart. All these together has effect on what is the sabello must function at ratio zero of these Milky Ways. And this is all degenerate with lack of resolution, because if you are not resolving very well, you are destroying your sabello's work. Okay, so these are, for example, again, two dark matter projections of Eris stars and Eris. And these are the locations of the top 20 satellites at ratio zero, where top 20, I mean, I rank them in mass. So first of all, well, I don't know if you are surprised, but one should be surprised a little to see that the geography, the locations of the top 20 are pretty different. Here I'm not telling you though, one, two things. First of all, these are two identical projections, but I didn't choose the projection to be, say, aligned with the spin of the halo. I could have chosen a specific projection to make the comparison more, more uh, realistic. Plus, I didn't tell you if the, all these 20 top has twins analog in the, in the other simulations. Um, where by me, twins, I really mean sabellos that uh, were born from the same Lagrangian regions at the initial conditions and evolved in the same manner. And actually, this is the best, the best part of the, of the exercise is to associate analogs and see who that, which, one, which twins survive and which one don't and how they change. So these are the main results. This is the differential mass function of Milky Way satellites, Sabellos, average zero, in Eris, and in Eris R. And this is the analog in terms of the cumulative Vmax function of the Sabellos, renormalized where Vmax is the Vmax of the Sabello, but I renormalized by the so-called VV of the host, which is a measure of the mass of the host. Well, however you plot it, average zero, you end up with a depletion in the number of satellites that survive a regime zero in the volume run. This is true above masses of 10 to the 7 solar masses. And this is true almost <coughs> all the way, but not completely. And, uh, and, um, and uh, I'm going to propose you a discussion that is for the moment only qualitative, because just to understand. So the ways you can start from a, a function like this to a function like that when you put patterns are multiple. So first of all, you can both kill object, or you can modify the variable. So you can really change the abundance, or you can simply change the variable, shifting the variable to the left or to the right. You can do both, right? So my guess is that everything happens. And so that's why it's so complicated to analyze this kind of thing. So first of all, this happens. What does this mean? That if I look at a, um, a sabello in Aries Dark and I look for its twin in the baryonic run, it's more probable that I don't find its twin in the baryonic run than vice versa. So really saying that the by ratio zero, I do have a number of sabellos in, in the embody only run which do not have a twin. So they got destroyed, they are not there. So really this is a matter of abundance. But I can also do that. So I do find the twins, and if I compare their properties, they got different because of the presence of the variants. And this was something that was claimed this summer, um, which is exactly that, that if you take the Vmax, you remember is the, the max of the rotation curve of the 
satellite in, in Eris Dark. Compared to the one in Eris, you always see that, that the bar, in these cases, you see that the variants have lower beam axis. Okay? And this is true at Rashi Zeno, and this is true even before they become satellites, so at info. So you suppress their beam axis, you suppress their inner mass concentration. What I'm saying is actually it happens also this other thing, which produces an echo in the Sabero mass function, in the Sabero B function, that is interesting per se. Because if you want to guess what is the probability of getting a Magellanic cloud in the universe, and you want to assess how peculiar it is the Milky Way, you should rather compare it, well, people have done it comparing to body simulations, but what I'm saying is that there will be activity and so that anything that can be derived by embody simulation only may not be the, in, may not be interesting. <coughs> so what I'm saying is that in the, the bulk of the satellite population has this effect for which Vmax goes there. It's reduced. So Vmax is somewhere here, okay? And what I'm saying is to pass from an embody only to a baryonic run, you have the, the quotation curves beyond a certain range, I mean, every year, and I wouldn't believe to anything below one kiloparticle gravity is a suppression. What I'm saying is that it happens also the opposite. This is the twin, this is the rotation curve of the, of the object in the air star, and this is the rotation curve in the, in the bionic run, and in which I have exactly the opposite. This B-max is here, around 12 kilometers per second compared to the bion run. And this is the case of a few satellites, and very peculiar, which are actually baryonic dominated in mass. And, uh, and they lost something like 97% of their mass. So the idea is that these produce stars in the right amount, if I do a stellar versus halo mass plot at info. They just undergo a crazy stripping, and by the end we see them at Rashi zero, they are baryonic dominated. And probably it's just a matter of moments after which they will be destroyed, and that we will not see them anymore. These are, for example, a satellites like M32, or other satellites of Andromeda. So in some sense, what I'm saying is that anything happened, but for the bulk of the population, when you pass from an embody-only simulation to a baryonic simulation, the rotation curves are suppressed. And this may be a natural explanation of, do you remember this too big to fail problem because these are the points of Irvine people. And I don't see trouble, actually, sometimes I see that my rotation curves are smaller. So, it seems that ma many things are solved, uh, but there are many problems with this simulation. Um, first of all, it appears we have a missing satellite problem in the simulation because we had just a handful of luminous satellites that survived. And this was suggested by this cumulative product in which I can take the rotation curve max in terms of the total component <coughs> in terms of the stars. And here you can see that I just have a few savelos which actually have stars at Rashi zero. I have just three or four compared to the 10 of the reality if you want to make comparisons. Another struggle is that even when I look at the embody simulation only at the dark and I compare it to the Alactia, and this is the cumulative mass function, and it's that appear to be Sabelo pool. And it's Sabelo pool, never mind which kind of renormalization I put here to take into account that the mass of a star is smaller than the mass of the 2 so of course it has less number of Sabelos. And then I had the trouble that when I look at the curves pro profiles of my Sabelos, I'm affected by resolution because it's really tricky to be sure down to which radius you can believe these profiles. And maybe you can believe profiles in the baryonic run because there are so many variants in the inner regions, but you can believe the twin because it has only dark matter. So these are all the troubles I have faced. But caveat those, I have a technical summary for this part. So essentially that in, in simulation like Eris, where there were specific prescription for star formation and star formation feedback and, and, and stellar feedback, I, I find that naturally the dark matter halo is contracted when you put the bias, remember? But and on top of it, 
still the profiles want to flatten. Um, I have the, on our, tendentially, the Milky Way Sabello community mass function is suppressed, but and then for the majority of the early satellites, it is suppressed because you're actually pushing down the variable in which you are describing either mass or remarks. But this is not always the case because still I have an end goal. So in some sense, what our simulation has to say is that, OK, variance in this course, so for, that, for what the matrix we have on the data point to the core versus cast issue, we don't have missing satellite problems in the sense that well, actually, it's the opposite. It's not that we have too little in the reality. We have too little in the, in the simulation. And there's not too big to fail at all. Not just because the baryonic, the virus pushed down the rotation curve, but because there is that is available for it as a start. And so the most mass is available at rotation curves, which are lower. But what I have to say is that uh, well, it's a tricky business. Um, the, in, the interpretation of, of the flattening of the matter profile, of the occurrence of the contraction, of the decrement in the Sabello mass function and on the angle is not straightforward and it's much more complicated than what simplistic analysis have shown most recently. The trouble here is that we don't have any predictive power at this, at this stage because if I change the UV background, I change the number of stars in the satellites, and this changed their profiles, and this changed their capability of surviving in Rashi Zero. Uh, I have to <coughs> follow more in detail the history of the individual satellites, and it's a pity that even with Aries, resolution limits are in ambush. And so one should do the following either run Aries with better resolution, and then also study Aries with many flavors of star formation density threshold. Star, star of feedback uh, efficiency or uh, method cooling at different times to see how much the physical prescription has effect on this angle, on this decrement, on the severe mass function, and on the flattening. So this is what I'm going to do. And to conclude, I just want to summarize uh, the first part of my talk that was on large scale on primordial and gasianity. Uh, and I hope I convey that primordial and gasianity is an excellent tool to discriminate on competing scenarios <coughs> for inflation. And we have ways to get to detect remote and sanity, not only on the CMB, but also with the large scale structure. And the effects of remote and sanity are relatively bigger at higher redshift and at higher halo mass. So if you have a cluster survey, you're done. And if you have a cluster survey with span of the sky, you're also done because the effects of remote and sanity and this halo bar, the scale dependence of the halo, halo bar is bigger, a bigger scale separation. And um, well, I also show some results of what Erosita will be able to do in uh, two years. Well, maybe in uh, four years when all the whole sky survey will be taken. And so please uh, just have a look in the next times about the uh, Erosita results. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Structure formation gets started early if you have not positive FNL, not gas enemy. So, if I how, it, how much does the shape of the cluster abundance change as opposed to just shifting the redshift? Or they, does the shape change or is it really just different times? Maybe I can't remember this answer. So, at fixed redshift, this is a, a differential approach abundance for in big of photon counts, the map with masses. Um, modifying, and this is the, the, the ratio to the fiducial model, the discussion, modifying parameters for different amounts. So this is, for example, FNL plus 100, which is the one, the two sigma levels of CMB right now. And this compared, like, for example, to the effect of changing sigma 8 within one sigma error part nowadays, <laughs> which is crazy. Okay. And this, for, for a count of density 2, Photons, which are on these fresh sheets, are group size kind of stuff. And, uh, and, um, but then, if you don't fix the redshift, but you do the redshift distribution, 
for example. So I knew that the animal would be sad in angle. As I do not rest shift, and this is the typical rest shift distribution of my cluster, and this is how the modern organic changes. And, and but you can see the effect is totally generated with a sigma eight that will do the same exact thing that you were saying, like like starting from a higher level and then evolving linearly from there. Um, so this is the trouble because if you, for example, do even if you attend to the five clusters and you don't bring in mass to to use the different mass dependence here, and you don't bring in redshift for the different dependencies in redshift of the two things, you don't see a thing because the parameters are all degenerate with each other. Then you have to start to bring and you and you kill a bit of the generalities. But still the counts are intrinsically limited in that because FNL modifies these quantities as anything as anything else essentially. So this is a bit of a trouble. Although um, you know again this is plus hundred eleven in FNL and we will be able to with Planck we will be plus minus six and, and here is sigma I mean it's crazy how we don't know actually the effect of sigma is a crazy effect. And it's a three point two percent error bar. So why is uh, why would error start to be different from the uh Philadelphia for type of the resolution or does this have to be something else? In terms of the number of sub Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <coughs> I go to the something else and then I discuss the resolution. So the something I I, I so the idea is that it was this thing, like if you do the Sabello cumulative Riemann function uh, at fixed host mass, um, we don't know really how tight the relation is. And if you talk to the Aquarius and the Dialactia people, they say that the dispersion is tiny because Dialactia and the Aquarius they all fall on each other. But go and look at that plot first of all, and second, um, the idea is that these zooming, sim zooming simulations they always hide a selection bias. So we do choose these Milky Ways, for example, to have a very uh, private recent merger history. So if you, and you can imagine that something with a prior merger history will have less surveillance because the, the bulk of the accretion of surveillance happened at the earlier time and they had all the time to die, to be destroyed. So actually, I, I spent a couple of weeks actually studying this dispersion in an body simulation of very good resolution is the Bolshoi box. Uh, in which I have, I have all the statistics I want because I can have hundreds and hundreds of hosts at different mass beams. And my conclusion is that although I cannot have hosts at the Milky Way, I think that the dispersion at fixed host mass has been uh, underestimated in the, in the past. And so if you admit that there is a dispersion that depends either on the environment or in the properties of the host, uh, then you can justify many differences. But this doesn't say much about the problem that we can be affected by resolution because lack of resolution makes you destroy more subheaders because that's what also I mentioned before. If you do the profile of a, of a header, you know, this is an Amara Frank and White, but a bit better. So this is an Amara Frank and White. Resolution makes you that. And a profile like this with a less deep potential well makes you your stripping much more efficient. And so you destroy them. And so um, our resolution tests were just the Pullman resolution. You always, it's amazing, you never go farther, right? You always go backwards. And yeah, I can say that our resolution going backwards are bad. But I, I want, I mean, to make a conversion test in these reports, I cannot do it too. And then and, uh, uh, I cannot exclude that this resolution. It, but I really think that dispersion in this amount, in this quantity was underestimated so far. Okay, let's continue. Um, 